morning. Welcome as we gather here for worship here at Gethsemane Lutheran Church, where we are joyfully learning, living, and sharing God's word. Yay! A special welcome to guests who join us this morning. Welcome. We're glad that you're here and able to worship with us. Whether you're here in person or whether you join us via our live radio or live video feed, welcome. It's not radio feed, so don't worry about that. Uh, today we celebrate the 25th Sunday of Pentecost, and it's also known as our culture of Veterans Day, so we'll be having a litany around that as well. This morning we also celebrate Holy Communion, where all are welcome and invited and encouraged to come to Christ's table to receive nourishment for your bodies, your minds, and your souls as well. And then during our time of prayers, we'll have a time of silence so that if you have additional prayers of concern or joy to lift up, we'll have, those, uh, we'll have the ability to do that as well. I now invite you just to take a few moments as Kelly continues to play for us as we prepare for worship this morning. Thank you.
Please remain seated as we continue with our Veterans Day Litany. God of love, peace, and justice, it is your will for the world that we may live together in peace. You have promised through the prophet Isaiah that one day the swords will be beaten into plowshares, yet we live in a broken world, and there are times that war seems inevitable. Let us recognize with humility and sadness the tragic loss of life that comes in war. Even so, as we gather here free from persecution, we may give thanks for those who have served with courage and honor. For those that are in the presence that are either in active duty or reserve duty, and the fathers, mothers, siblings, spouses, children, and grandparents of those that are currently serving, please rise. Together, we pray. God, we praise you for those that are willing to serve. Let all soldiers, Marines, sailors, airmen, and Coast Guardsmen serve with honor, pride, and compassion. Do not let their hearts be hardened by the actions they must take. Strengthen their families, shield them from danger, keep them surrounded in your love and peace. You may be seated. For those that are in our presence that have served in the military in the past, please rise. We pray together. God, we praise you for those that have served in the military. We thank you for those that put the welfare of others ahead of their own safety. Heal them by means of your Holy Spirit let us all be inspired by their self-sacrifice and service to those who need protection. Thank you. For those that are in our presence who have lost a loved one in war, please rise. We pray. God, we praise you for those that have made the ultimate sacrifice. We ask that you comfort those that still feel the pain of their loss. Keep us mindful that you have promised to comfort those that mourn. And for those who are gathered in your name in safety because of the sacrifices of others, please rise. We pray. God, we praise you for granting us these freedoms. Let us honor those who have served by working for peace. Let us never forget those that have served. And let us never go the promise of peace. Amen. We continue with our gathering hymn, number 890, My Eyes Have Seen the Glory.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. God of justice, you sent your servant Micah to proclaim justice and peace to a world that lacked both. Make us instruments of justice and peace so that your world might prosper. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated as we listen to God's word for us this morning. The reading this morning is from selected verses of the prophet Micah that includes verses from chapters 1, 5, and 6. The readings, in the readings, Micah warns the people of Jerusalem that they need to repent of false worship that focuses only on ritual and turn their attention to God's true passion for justice. The recent destruction of Samaria provides an example of what not to do and the consequences of thwarting God's wishes. The reading. The word of the Lord came to Micah of Moresheth in the days of King Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Hear you peoples, all of you. Listen, O earth, and all that is in it, and let the Lord God be a witness against you the Lord from his holy temple. But you, O Bethlehem of Epiphrath, you are who are one of the little clans of Judah. From you shall come forth for me one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from old, from ancient days. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has brought forth. Then the rest of his kindred shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall live secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be the one of peace. With what shall I come before the Lord? and bow myself before God on high. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? Word of God, word of life. Praise, Praise, Praise be to God. God. Please stand for the Alleluia and our gospel reading. Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, Lord. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, 
And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, Jesus said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, but the sinners. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord. You may be seated. And do we have any young ones this morning? I see, oh, there they are. Hey, Ellie. Hey, Lily. Good morning, ladies. So I, got, I caught a question for you this morning. I know everybody else is sick today. Are you feeling okay? Okay. Huh? Yep. Yeah, we have a lot of people that are sick today. That's not good, is it? Mm -mm. So do you know where you were born? Hmm. You were born in a hospital. Do you know what city you were born in? Lexington. Okay, so you don't know. You would, you would think maybe closer in the country? Okay. Okay. All right, probably a little bit closer to the country. <laughs> Baptist Health. <laughs> okay, this is not a commercial for any of the nearby hospitals. Um, I was actually born in a little, in a city that was in northwest Indiana, too, and um, it's the same city that Michael Jackson was born in. It was Gary, Indiana. <laughs> That's my claim to fame. Um, but, you know, some people were like, what could come out of Gary, Indiana? That was just, at the time that I was growing up, it wasn't a nice place to be from. Um, and so the prophet Micah was also talking about a city, a very little city that he said something great is going to come out of that city. Do you know what that city was named? I'll give you a hint. We sing about it at Christmas time and we sing, oh little town of Bethlehem, correct. So he's talking about Bethlehem and he says, this little town which was famous because that's where their most beloved King David, remember David, the story about David, who killed the, the, the giant with just a little rock and a slingshot? Okay, that's where, that's where David was born. He was from Bethlehem. But it was a really little town. I mean, we're talking teeny, teeny, tiny town. Just like one or two houses. Yep, not a stoplight, not a traffic light, Probably not a grocery store, nothing like that, nothing big. <laughs> She's like, okay, so it's very, very little. And then Micah also says it's from, that's where the little clan, the little family came from, a little tribe of Israel, which means something like something really insignificant. Do you know what that word is, insignificant? It's a big word. It means something that would go normally unnoticed, that you wouldn't even notice if you passed by. It's so small, it's so little, it's so unimportant, it's low. And he says, out of this city, out of this little tiny city, is gonna come a leader, someone for the people of God someone who will be about peace. Who do you think he was talking about? Jesus. He was talking about Jesus. Close. Close. Michael was saying, there's going to be somebody who's, you think he's really little. You know, stand up a second. I wanna, I'm going to see how tall, how tall are you? Do you know how tall you are? About four feet. You're about four. Yeah, you're about four feet. What about you, Lily? Do you know about how tall you are? Maybe. 
Uh, you're about four feet too. Yes, I think you might be even a little bit taller than four feet. I am a little bit taller than four feet. I'm pretty tall. Oh, okay, because you're pretty tall. Well, you know what? Okay, so you both are pretty tall. You're about four feet tall. But look how tall he is. Are you as tall as he is? No, you're not. Does that make you small? Does that make you insignificant? You're still very, really powerful. That's what I want you to know. And that's what you came up with that all by yourself. Why are you still very powerful? Who lives inside of you? God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, all three of those live inside of you. Well, he's going, oh. Huh? You need to what? Okay. Um, so God lives inside of you, and then that means even if you're not that tall, even if you're as small as Jay is, you can do powerful things. You're tiny right now. And you can do powerful things because you know why? God is inside of you. And you are important. Not only because God is inside of you, but what else? Who made you? Jesus. God made you too. God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit made you guys too. So, you are important. So out of this little, little bitty town of Bethlehem came somebody really important, Jesus. And that teaches us, even out of our little ordinary lives, we can do stuff that's important too. Because we have Jesus inside of us. Right? Right. Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for the little town of Bethlehem, where Jesus was from. Thank you for Jesus, who lives inside of us, so we too can do great things, can do great things. Even if we're small, even if we're young, even if we're little. In Jesus' name we pray. And we all three say, Amen. Thank you, guys. I like when they come up with a sermon for me so that I don't have to. <laughs> Next time we'll just let them do it, I think. Grace, mercy, and peace to you in the name of God who creates and loves us. In the name of Jesus who saves and loves us. In the name of the Holy Spirit that fills and renews and refreshes us with that same love. So can you recall maybe the last time that you were out on the road and some other driver maybe crowded in too close to you or pulled out too soon in front of you or perhaps parked too crooked next to you or drove too slow or too fast to suit you? just this morning. <laughs> Isn't our first response to mutter, what a crummy driver that person is? Or in other words, huh? Something like or something that. like that. <laughs> and we didn't have confession today, dear, and I am so sorry. I'll give you absolution anyway. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, but that's our, isn't that our instinct? We try to elevate our own driving skills higher so that we're not as low as that person is. Or maybe our house is a mess because it's the kid's fault. Yeah. <laughs> or we haven't done our taxes 
because it's the government's fault, right, Bob? Because <laughs> you got so many to do, it's the government's fault that it's due on that same day every week or every year. Um, or our weight is too big because darn those carbohydrates. <laughs> Except for a few depressed moments, we can generally convince ourselves that we stand above any other person's sin. Even though we know we're not perfect, we can sure spot those who are obviously less perfect than ourselves. And in that way, we kind of find some type of reassurance. So where are we today? On the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month in the year of 1918, hostilities ceased. 11, 11, 11. Exactly 100 years ago today. World War II had been raging for four long years, leaving nine million soldiers dead. 21 million soldiers wounded. Germany, Russia, France, and Great Britain each lost about a million soldiers. The United States, we suffered 116,000 losses, which in comparison is twice as many that we lost in Vietnam. By the end of the war, Germany was running out of soldiers, running out of supplies, and the country was facing an imminent invasion. So then on November the 11th of 1918, the Germans met with allied forces in a railroad, in a railroad car, that's hard to say, in France. And there they signed an armistice treatment agreement, a temporary suspension of hostilities. World War I was over. No more blood would be shed. And then the remembrances <clears throat> began. One year later, on November the 11th, many countries declared that to be Armistice Day. And it became a U.S. holiday in 1938. And later, after World War II and the Korean War, we changed the name from Armistice Day to Veterans Day. So today is now a holiday which is dedicated to American veterans of all of our wars. Ironically, the day that Armistice Day became a celebration, a holiday in the United States, that weekend was the night of Kristallnacht in Germany and Austria. The night of November 9th and 10th when German Nazis attacked Jewish persons and properties. 80 years ago. The name Kristallnacht refers ironically to the litter of broken glass that was in all these cities across the country that made it look like crystal shining in the darkness. The violence continued for days after these attacks. It started under the pretext of a German diplomat being shot by a Polish German, I'm sorry, a Polish Jewish student. And after Adolf Hitler heard about this, he gave orders from Munich, Germany to gather up all the stormtroopers, urging violent retaliation in Germany and Austria. Fire companies were ordered to stand by the synagogues, watching them burn in flames. Police were ordered to arrest the victims. In two days and nights, more than 1,000 synagogues were burned and damaged. Rioters ransacked and looted 7,500 Jewish businesses. 10 billion marks of damage was done, including 10 million marks of damage just for the glass that was broken. Can you imagine? 
30,000 Jewish males from 16 years old to 60 were arrested. And to accommodate all these prisoners, they had to expand three concentration camps. After Kristallnacht, the Nazi re regime made Jewish survival in Germany impossible. The scary thing that I find out about, that I, that I see about this, that happened 80 years ago, was just after this happened, a psychologist interviewed these Nazi, some random, random Nazi party members. And 63% of them expressed extreme indignation over what had happened to the Jewish people. 63% were upset about what had happened. Only 5% approved of this racial persecution. And the rest were indifferent leading 5%, leading to over 6 billion people dying. Today, sadly enough, the Times Magazine reported recently that only a third of Americans believe that less substantially less than six billion Jews were murdered in the Holocaust. I think maybe a million, not quite a million, not that many people were murdered or killed. Six million were murdered. Seventy percent of us believe that we care less than we used to. And 58 percent of us believe it could happen again. So where are we? Let's look at our biblical context of where we're at in Micah. Micah, which means who is like the Lord? It's this ironic, sarcastic question, meaning no one is like God. We have passed the days of the United Kingdom where the kings of David and Solomon have ruled, where the 12 tribes of Israel had all been united into one kingdom instead of 50 separate kingdoms or states. They were one kingdom. The 12 tribes of Israel were now divided into two kingdoms, the 11 smaller ones to the north called Israel, and the one larger tribe to the south called Judah. And they split because of idolatry and injustice. Last week we heard about Elijah who was from the northern kingdom and he was prophesying to the northern kingdom of Israel about what was going to happen because of the injustice and the impropriety and the idolatry that was going on. And now it's a hundred to 150 years later, and we hear about Micah, who's from this small southern shepherd town in the southern kingdom, and his contemporaries are the prophets Isaiah and Amos and, Mos and Hosea. Hosea. And he's speaking for all those downtrodden who are out in the countryside, who are being, who are suffering at the hands of the rich landowners. This is a time of political unrest and injustice. And according to Gregory Ron, he says idolatry equals injustice. The sins that the prophets point in and to, both the northern and the southern kingdoms, he says, can be summed up as idolatry and injustice. These two can't be easily separated. You can't worship the one true God of Israel and continue to commit injustice. And idolatry often boils down to worshiping ourselves. And if you're worshiping yourself and your desires, you can't be just, since justice is about caring for 
the others and not about yourself. So the northern kingdom falls to the Assyrian army. The capital of Samaria, which is in the Semitic language of meaning guard because the city was on top of this mountain and it was this um, fortified palace made of ivory and pagan wealth and luxury thought never to fall. But the Assyrians took it over and they were headed to Jerusalem just 10 miles away is the enemy. That's the closest Versailles is to us today. And what happens? The king of Judah decides he's going to pay off the Assyrian army and the king with money so they'll leave him alone. And they survive for another couple, almost a couple hundreds of years. So the book of Micah just then fluctuates between condemnation of worshiping other gods and worshiping ourselves and injustice. And then hope at the same time. First of all, there's condemnation of the north. Do you see what happened to the people of the north? They were worshiping other gods. They were worshiping themselves. They didn't care about other people. And look what happened to them. Oh, by the way, we're headed down that same path, he tells the country of Judah. And then Micah also declares that, you know what? God isn't impressed with this over-the-top worship. Yeah, we have that problem today, don't we? So many people are just throwing millions and millions of dollars into our offering plate. No, no, stop it. But back then, the rich and the wealthy were doing whatever they wanted. They were following their gods of greed, of self, of power, of control. And then they were doing over-the-top worship. And that made it all okay, right? Because they're worshiping then God. Burnt offerings meant the most extravagant kind of offering because if you burnt something up on the altar, what did you get back? Nothing. The calves that were a year old, they were the most expensive of the animals. Let's, I know, let's donate a thousand rams, 10,000 rivers of oil, our firstborn son. That was also happening in those days of Judah and other nations. Micah isn't saying, stop doing these things. Instead, Micah's saying, what kind of offering is that in lieu of all the things that you're doing? This isn't about our relationship with God. This is about how we are supposed to respond to all the blessings God has given us. Hmm. Seems like a theme we keep hearing. We are blessed to be a blessing to others. So the next Micah says, you are all called to action. And one of the two popular verses of Micah, Micah 6, 8, what does the Lord require, seek of you to do, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? To do justice, mishpat in the Hebrew, refers to God's order of how things are to be done. It's kind of like having a legal courtroom, a judge deciding what is just, what is right in every aspect of your lives. Wouldn't that be lovely? No? What about you're having a trouble in a relationship? You know, that person's not doing what you want them to do. Have a judge come and say, no, this is what's going to be right. Still no? Justice. 
requires commitment in our day-to-day -day activities. Joseph Fletcher said, justice is nothing other than love working out our problems. And Benjamin Dris Drisale said, justice is truth in action. Justice is doing what is right simply because, even if it's uncomfortable or not possible. One of the mistakes that we make is sometimes thinking justice equals fairness. But justice isn't always fairness. Johnny Carson once said, if life was fair, Elvis would be alive and all the impersonators would be dead. <laughs> justice isn't about being fair. Justice is doing what is right in the eyes of God. Justice. And then to do loving kindness, hesed. If you were here for Norma's funeral service, we talked about hesed being more than loving kindness. It means being faithful and steady and loyal and covenantal love, which means it is unbreakable. Loving kindness is keeping God steadfast steadfast, faithful, loving, loyal, covenantal love in all relationships. We're also called to love kindness or love mercy, as some translations say. George McDonald wrote in Discovering the Character of God, he says, I believe justice and mercy are simply one and the same thing. Without justice to the full, there can be no mercy. And without mercy, there can be no justice. And then finally, we are called to walk humbly with God. What do you think of when you think of somebody being humble? I think of the actor Tom Selleck, who says, whenever I get full of myself, I remember the nice elderly couple who approached me with a camera one day in Honolulu. And when I struck a pose for them, the man said, no, we don't want your picture. We want you to take a picture of us. <laughs> Hasirena is more than modesty or humility. It implies paying attention to what God is doing. People are watching for what God is doing that is good. Following the path of God, whether it is up on the mountaintop or down in the low of the valley, in the deep darkness, knowing all the way God is leading the way, following. So what do those all look like? Reverend King Duncan teaches it with this fable. He says, two people are strolling by a riverside when suddenly they see a baby in the river and they jump in and rescue the baby and turn them over to someone who rushes the baby to a hospital. The next day, they see two babies in the river. And once again, they rescue the babies and hand them over to two strangers who then rush them to the hospital. The following day, though, there's so many babies in the river that they have to call the emergency medical service and rescue as many babies as they can. But unfortunately, many of the babies struggle and die. And the first man says to the other, isn't it wonderful through our faith that we were here during this tragic time of need and able to save these babies? And yes, says the other man, but I think we better get moving and go ahead, go to the head of the river and find out why are these babies getting thrown into the river in the first place? Rescuing babies is important, that's kindness. But going to the head of the river to determine and to stop the babies being thrown into the river is justice, and we need both. What does the Lord require of you? To do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with your God. There are all kinds of opportunities for us to be living like God's people in our world today. 
Jack Stevens said he once re had an opportunity with a phone call that he received from a friend who just needed a favor. A problem had come up in the family and they needed Jack to fill in for him by taking a little boy to a hospital. The boy had leukemia and probably only had a, f a short time to live. And since the boy's home was near to where Jack lived, he agreed to the friend's response request. And after 30 minutes, the mother and the boy were in the car in the front seat and the child was so weak, he was lying in his mother's lap and his feet were stretched across the seat and lying over Jack's leg. And after starting the car, Jack glanced down at the little boy who was staring at him and their eyes met and Jack smiled at the little boy and the little boy said, Mister, are you God? Jack was surprised by that question and he answered, no son, why do you ask? And the little boy responded saying, Mama said God would come soon and take me with him. What does the Lord require of us? To do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with God. And then finally in the book of Micah, in that whole book of judgment comes hope. Such hope is powerful to us because in Micah 5, it tells of this little town of Bethlehem, of Ephrathah, who one of those little clans of Judah will come one who will lead us, who will provide security. And we know Micah's prophecy held true because a leader, our leader, came forth from Bethlehem. And that leader has done and does hold us securely in God's loving arms. And the message of that is hope wins. Hope wins. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to Jesus, our Savior and our hope. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able as we sing our hymn of the day, number 717, Let Justice Flow Like Streams. worship bulletin as we respond to our faith with the words of the Apostles Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, 
and the life everlasting. Amen. With the people of God gathered here and throughout the world, we offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need. O oh God, preserve your church from empty piety. Stir up our will to act with mercy and compassion. Keep our bishops, pastors, teachers, and all who proclaim your good news strong in faith. Lord, in your mercy, provide all living things with sufficient food and clean water. Make us ever mindful of the farmers and laborers who supply us with food and open our hands to share what we have received. Lord, in your mercy, awaken our nation to care for veterans and others who have experienced the stress and trauma of war or other military conflicts. Inspire us to promote the well-being of those who have put themselves in the service of others. Lord, in your mercy, bow down to meet those who are trampled. Greet them with mercy and give new life to those who feel overwhelmed or broken by discrimination, grief, or illness. We include those from our prayer list and those we now name either aloud or silently. Lord, in your mercy. Bless the ministries in our community that reach out to people who are unnoticed or neglected. Give us a common vision of, vi of justice that eliminates hunger, greed, and self-righteousness. Lord, in your mercy. Bind us together with the saints of every time and place until we join them around your throne. Lord, in your mercy. Enfold all things in your compassion, O God, and bring us into your life through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace, the shalom of Christ be with you always. And also you. Please share God's peace with God's people.
Let us pray. Creator God, you made everything, and you provide for every need. The bread we break and the wine we pour come from you. As we eat and drink with thanksgiving, fill us with your love. Let that love flow through us to others, and join us to the saints before us in a holy and boundless communion. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord is with you. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, it is right, right to give our thanks and praise. Thanks. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should, at all times and in all places, give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God. Through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. <laughs> our bread of life, our table, and our food. You created a world in which all might be satisfied by your abundance. You dined with Abraham and Sarah, promising them life and fed your people Israel with manna from heaven. You sent your son to eat with sinners and to become food for the world. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his life given for us and his rising from the grave, we await his coming again to share with us the everlasting feast. By your spirit, nurture and sustain us with this meal. Strengthen us to serve all in hunger and want, and by this bread and cup, make of us the body of your Son. Through him all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. We pray the prayer Lord Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Hunger no more, thirst no more. Come to the banquet of life. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. You may be seated until the ushers direct you to come forward for communion.
Stand as you're able. May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen us and keep us forever in his faith. Amen. Sovereign God, in this meal you give us a foretaste of the great feast to come. Keep us faithful to you that we, with all your saints, may at length celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the love of God surround you, the grace of Christ release you, the Holy Spirit be your guide and strength now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. We sing our sending hymn number 815. Number 815. If you would like to sing I Want to Walk as a Child of the Light, you might want to be on page 815. <laughs> no, nobody knows.
Thank you for joining us to worship on this beautiful Sunday in the, no in the November season that almost feels like January here in Kentucky. Please take home your bulletins. There's lots of information in there. We also have the November newsletter out in the lobby area. We have Sunday school for all ages. Um, info is on page 15. Our other form of liturgical worship is called Bless Be Loved Every Second Sunday which is this Sunday at six o'clock. We have another form of worship where um, one of our own, Mike DeLong, will be sharing a, uh, a message for tonight. So all are invited to come back and join us for that and a light supper afterwards. Uh, Mary Circle is meeting on Monday, correct, Barbara? At, anything to add? Okay. And then our November outreach is on page 17, where we are doing the Christmas tree. Anything to add to that, Carol or Enid? We also have next Sunday is our Thanksgiving feast. I know there's a sign-up sheet out there uh, for us to do that. Any other? I don't see Angela here. Yes, Megan. Okay, okay. We have a lot of sickies. Okay, and then also next Sunday is our Women of the ELCA or Gethsemane Lutheran Church Women of the ELCA Thank Offering Sunday, where they will be displaying the projects that the women have worked hard on this previous year and will be blessing them and also doing a special offering towards the larger church as well. So, Enid. Okay. Other other announcements. Okay. Melanie. I'd like to give a big shout out of praise today for our musicians and our choir. They did an amazing Yes, they show. did. Really nice celebration Yay! Pam. <laughs> this is the last Sunday that we'll ask for a financial commitment um, on Christian Alpha Pool Center. So if you would like to give to the opportunity or have not Kathy. Okay, our auction is coming up quickly, so we need to be able to wine wall. So anytime you want to join and bring your wine, you can give it to yourself or my husband Art or Chris, who's not here, Chris Williams. So we start bringing in the wine so we can bring our wine wall. Ten dollars at least. Ten dollars at least. Any other announcements? Anything else? Daryl, Darren, send us on our way. Sorry. 